We are thrilled to be in the kitchen with two of the world's iconic throwing coaches, Tom House and Alan Jager. Of course, Tom House, co-founder of Mustard. I always say Tom is the most successful personal sports coach in the history of the world. And I think that that's indisputable. Uh, I know Tom's embarrassed by that, but only person ever to work with athletes in multiple sports at a Hall of Fame level, actually in their mechanics. Uh, the same guy was Nolan Ryan's pitching coach and is Tom Brady's throwing coach. So pretty tough to beat that. Tom, always a treat. Thanks for being here. Uh, and Thank Alan Jager. Alan Jager looking particularly sharp today in his white mustard hoodie. Love to see that. Uh, look, this is a treat for me. When I was pitching in college and pro ball, I was really, really lucky. Considered myself super fortunate at the time to work with Alan and his team at, at Jager Sports. Um, really impactful for me in terms of my arm care program. Was the first person to, to teach me how to meditate, which is obviously a huge component of what we're doing here at Mustard. Uh, and, and the yoga program, I think, really helped me prolong my still short career, but prolonged it, you know, longer than it would have been. And Alan has just been a pioneer uh, in terms of arm care, but also mental performance, particularly in baseball, but across sports. So awesome, uh, awesome to have you both for conversation today. Today's really about long toss. Lots of things we could talk to the two of you about, but long toss kind of central to what a lot of young pitchers are doing for development, or at least maybe ought to be doing. Yes. Um, and I think both of you really at the forefront of uh, incorporating that into routines and thinking about how it's best incorporated into routines. So today we'd love to talk about what each of you think are the best practices for long toss and maybe draw out some of the differences and reasons for the differences uh, in some of your teachings on, on long toss programs. Uh, so with that, maybe Tom, we could we could start with you. And in thinking about long toss, what are some kind of general best practices, a general program that you would recommend to, let's call it a high school developing pitcher? I, I'd be glad to. And I, I think Alan and I are, are one of the same on this. I, I, I really believe in today's world, kids pitch too much and don't throw enough. Um, we were talking off camera earlier on when, when we were kids, we were throwing something all the time. And now you might run across a 14 year old pitcher that has really never thrown where, for workloads on flat ground, but he spent a lot of time on the mound. So not only did I, did I experience it as a player and a coach, but the research shows that playing catch, throwing you know, with, with, with some intensity at various distances on flat ground helped build what, what we call endurance into the arm that a lot of kids aren't paying attention to. We're, we're a species that learn how to throw things on flat ground and long toss on flat ground is one of the safest way to make sure you have parity in the accelerators and the decelerators in your arm. And as long as you keep it functional and to tolerance, um, there's no bad that can come out of long toss. So Tom, can we can we ask you to kind of you know go through again if it's helpful to pick an age? Let's take a you know a fifteen year old pitcher, and what is a what does a long toss program look like for you? Well, our belief system and our research has held up that long toss is as long as you can throw perfectly, and and long toss after you like if I pitched in a ball game last night, and I say I threw five or six innings. I, I need to throw on flat ground and throw some long toss today, but long toss today might only be 90 feet, where three days after you've been in a, in a competitive ball game, long toss might be 115, 130, who knows? But long toss is as far as you can throw perfectly when it comes to mechanics. And obviously the tolerance to distance is, um, it's, it's something that has to be monitored and quantified if, it, if at all possible. And I, I'm sure Alan will back this up with his research, but if you can throw five rounds of 15, this is the outside limit of what I do, no matter what, I, no matter what the athlete's age is, long toss on a given day when you're in, um, 
effectively in an endurance building uh, off season uh, area code it would be five sets of 15 at maximum intensity. And that's 75 pitches and five sets of 15 at maximum intensity with the best mechanics you can, can come up with is virtually the, the same equivalent endurance wise as pitching off the mound. Awesome. Alan, with that, maybe we can uh, turn it over to you just for a kind of general overview. Um, probably you agree with some of the big points Tom's raising there. We'd love to just kind of hear your overview of a great long toss program. Yeah, well, first of all, our, our long toss program starts with one basic principle, which is listen to your arm, listen to your body. So um, on any given day, I'll never know how much I'm going to throw today or tomorrow or the next day. And, and, and no program will know that. The, only the individual intuitively will know, of course, what's in the arm that day. And we can probably get into this later, but ironically, when you really remove any parameters, it's amazing intuitively what an athlete will do. Um, you know, Tom was talking earlier, one of the things that jumped out at me about throwing and conditioning versus pitching is I always have a running joke with people who has the healthiest, strongest, and most durable arm on a baseball field. And the answer is the BP pitcher, because they make three, 400 throws a day at, at 70% with low, you know, medium intent, um, six days a week for 40 years. Um, and so to me, number one, I would say like along the lines of Tom, that long toss is as much about <clears throat> listening to your arm, arm conditioning, but our goal is to get guys to throw as far as we can. And I think this is where Tom and I might, and it might be um, semantics. I'm not sure because I, you know, I'm going to, I'm curious what Tom means by perfect mechanics. But for us, we actually want as much variability and as much variance as possible because we find that variance and variability taps into the more intuitive athletic nature of an athlete. So as an example, I know that a lot of pitching coaches um, may want athletes to stay in a certain mechanical state, if you will, that's maybe replicating more who they look like on the mound. And we're almost, I, I don't want to say the opposite, but we, we push sort of toward the opposite. We actually want to, what I, the, the term that we love to use is freedom. Um, to me, I feel like your most intuitive actions in any sport, any walk of life, surgery, arguing a lock, a case in court, it comes out of freedom. If you study the zone, I know Tom does a ton of stuff with mental, emotional stuff. Uh, if you study the zone, the zone is about being really unconscious. You're in a state of complete freedom. There's zero inhibition. Um, and so for us, we actually want guys getting out further and further and the, our arc will increase as much as to 40 degrees um, to where you're actually gonna see our athletes look um, in, in positions that may not may not look quite like they look on the mound, but ultimately, whatever we do to come out of the, the athlete's mechanics, so to speak, we come back to the mechanics on the way back in and what we call the pull down phase. So ultimately we're coming back to what you would call maybe a baseline of the mechanics. The difference is, is that we feel like we've taken that freedom, range of motion, intuitive, um, you know, naturalness of how the body maybe wants to move when it's freed up and not trying to maybe be in a certain mechanic. And then we, we put that athlete back, so to speak, in the mechanics. And I'll just say one last thing and then we can keep going. Um, I have a, a line I love, I tweet out all the time, which is your best mechanics come out of long toss. So we find uh, an athlete will repeat best as a byproduct of being so intuitively connected um, and so, um, so anyway, that would be, I mean, there's, you know me, I can go on for three hours about this, but, um, but I think it would be a really cool follow-up question because I'm curious, because when Tom says perfect mechanics, we might be actually saying the same thing. And so I'm curious, like Tom, how would you define perfect mechanics? Because um, I think that would actually help with maybe some of the jargon I'm using as well. Sure, and, and it, it, it's funny how you talk you're coming from one direction, I'm coming from another, but we're arriving at the, at the same thing. Uh, distance magnifies mistakes and exacerbates injury. So when I say throw as far as you can perfectly, 
Um, we know for a fact that if your head moves too much, it's going to cause um, location issues as, as well as distance issues. You don't want any vector in your body, head, arms, legs, or torso going anywhere but directly at what you're throwing at. So Nolan used to um, run and gun. Um, what, what you might run and gun and step behinds and um, crow hop are all the same idea as what we call GFF in mustard. Go friggin' fast, right? Keep your eyes level, keep your front side firm and drag your foot back foot into release. And um, your body's not done. The, the, I wish I could give it to you in German, but the, the Germans have a phrase that says, your body's not dumb if you'll let it be smart. And, and you watch a shortstop coming across the infield when he's thrown. Not, not only will that distance be um, within the realm of being able to throw perfect, but his, his, his body will be perfect as fast as he can go. His eyes will stay level. A level head will give you an arm slot that is natural to you. And the fact that you're throwing on a line across the infield allows your location to be programmed at a larger distance than it would be if you were on the mound. So all those things that you just said are the same things that I'm saying. It's, it's just the way you implement them. But, and the one thing I, I want to caution is that uh, throwing is to throw anything, you have to expend energy. And, and energy can only build strength when nerves and muscles are asked to perform with efficiency to adapt and accommodate to the tasks that they compete with. And that was a long sentence, which basically you, you don't want to, from our perspective, you don't want to train your body neurologically with a skill, neural pathway program, with something that you're not going to use when you get on the mound. So it's one of the reasons that um, we try not to teach both a windup and a stretch. We do everything from a stretch position to simplify the learning curve neurologically, muscularly, and skill acquisition wise. And it's age specific and it's relative to what the individual's functional strength can be based on how much he's grown and how much, he, how much weight he's gained and putting all those pieces together when you, when you apply it to a regular uh, throwing program, we'll call it long toss, call it what you want, but a regular flat ground throwing program, it's, there's nothing to replace that to get to the mound. And I, I've got to give credit where credit to early on, Glenn Fleissig got all over me about our pitching on flat ground. And he was actually the first with wireless CMG to say, you know, it takes more strength to throw hard on a flat ground than it does to throw hard on the mound. And that's awesome. And without, without him knowing it, he just gave credence to the fact that the only unnatural thing about throwing is the mound. Because when you go down the mound, it actually helps, helps you throw harder at the expense of your decelerators on your backside. And that's what makes mountain work um, not natural to a throwing athlete. So to go with what you said, the freedom of your body to interpret throwing, athletes left to their own devices will figure out the most efficient way for them to throw. And, and that's what regular throwing as part of a flat ground program will do to adapt and help an athlete accommodate what he's supposed to do when he goes between the lines. I said all that with one breath, Rocky. Well, I'll give you a second to breathe, but let me ask you a, a follow-up question there along the same lines um, Alan was asking about. You both used um, different phrases that I wonder if they mean the, the same thing. Um, Tom, you said uh, folks ought to do long toss to tolerance, and, and Alan said folks ought to listen to their arm. 
I'm wondering if there's any difference there. Tom, like when you say two tolerance, what does that mean? Does that mean a coach watching them to see if they deviate from their mechanics or does that mean listening to their arm basically? No, it's basically when they have to manufacture either strength or a movement to get the ball out of their hand to reach a target, when they have to change something other than what is GFF and let it happen naturally, they're probably not in a position where they're gonna learn or have their arm uh, adaptation take place efficiently. So when we say to tolerance, uh, the next sentence is usually throw that distance when you can keep mechanical efficiency or to make it simple to throw perfectly. That's great. Um, well, Alan, maybe we can take that back to you. And I wanna, I wanna play on this, this point Tom brought up about short stops. Um, because this actually came up in another conversation this week. So our next guest host in the kitchen is Lucas Giolito, okay? Who's doing great, famously revamped his mechanics a few years ago, and he's going to teach people kind of how, how they can learn from that. And he was describing to me that really what revamped his mechanics, it wasn't him deciding he wanted to have a shorter arm path or wanted to move further faster down the mound for mechanical purposes, he was trying to be more athletic. Okay. That was the phrase he kept thinking. And he was throwing weighted balls, but very specifically with his, with his pitching coach, I'm sure, you know, Ethan Katz, um, they were throwing weighted balls as if he were a shortstop or a second baseman and really thinking about it that way. So what do you, you know, what's, what do you, what do you think about that concept of being athletic, being free um, within sort of those parameters where you're still throwing, throwing on a line? Yeah, so again, I don't have the, the research like Tom does as far as the neurology and, and what have you and how the body works more on a, on a physical level um, as far as repeating something over and over and staying within that, that path. My experience my entire life, and I go back to when I played and threw myself, so I'm going back to when I was, as far as I can remember, maybe 16, so maybe 40 years. Everything for me, it feels like I have to first address the athleticism and the freedom of, of just what feels intuitive to my body. Now, for me, that meant throwing the ball at different release points, at different arc, at, 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 at different angles, which completely brought me out of what you might call more normal mechanics or what my mechanics should look like on a mound or would look like on a mound. But I had to first in, in, tap into the feeling of how my body wanted to work organically and intuitively. Um, and so for me, we don't want linear throwing. We want linear throwing at the end. We, so we don't want guys staying in their mechanics. That was sort of my opening. We want the opposite in a weird kind of way. We want imperfect mechanics. That, that's not really the right way to say it. We want var variability to me is the best word, which I stole from Randy Sullivan. Um, we just want the, the athlete to intuitively come out. We don't want any concepts of what it should look like or could look like. Yes, if you're dealing with a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old, we, we might have to talk a little bit more about form and, and, and A, Bs, and Cs of what, where you should be. Um, but I think what I'm trying to say with our long toss approach is we literally, I, I won't tell the person, but we had a player come to us once um, who was so really mechanically tied up. And this is, we've all dealt with this. This is not unusual, um, but he was so mechanically tied up that the first day he came out to work with, with me, he was waiting for me to tell him things. And I just said, look, I'm not saying a word to you the first day. And I know this is gonna be really hard for you, but you are not allowed to think about anything today. I, I don't care if the ball goes 800 feet over the guy's head to the right or to the left. I go, I want you to just be free and athletic and let's see where the ball goes. And, and I guess that to me is the simplest way to keep coming back to this concept of really tuning into the intuition of the body. I happen to feel intuitively that my body and the players that I've been around, athletically, they actually want to throw with more and more arc. And the main reason why is health. It's range of motion. It feels good when you start freeing up the arm at different angles. And by the way, it feels good to the core, the pelvis, the legs. So anytime I start moving the body in different ways that are coming out of my mechanics, that feels good. It's actually like a visceral effect. And so 
with Lucas as an example, ironically, Lucas is a local kid, so he, he actually came up, you know, learning our program as well. But I, I would say that um, if a player says to me, I'm going to go out and throw like a shortstop, to me, I'm thinking more in terms of he wants to be more athletic. He, he wants to kind of get free of whatever his mechanical checkpoints are. And so I guess I would just keep coming back to this idea of we want the athlete to, to come out of maybe what would be more of a linear approach, uh, because for us, we just want, we want variability. That's just the bottom line. I, I don't know the law. I don't know the physics of it. Um, but I also feel like that sometimes when you keep, like if you throw, if you're trying to perfect something over and over again, I almost feel like that also, and I'm getting, again, I'm not talking from science, I'm talking from feel. That, that also to me can feel almost like too restricting, too limiting. Again, there, there's, not, there's not a lot of color there, right? It's too black and white. It's almost like the body is saying, don't get me wrong, I'm a reps guy. I can hit a tennis ball against the wall for four hours or shoot hoops for four hours straight. And I am working on the same thing over and over. It's not to say that there's not a place for that. Absolutely there is. Maybe what I'm saying is there's both parts. I, the linear part is definitely organizing the mechanics, getting you know the the the, uh, the science that Tom has done, making sure the checkpoints are right. Absolutely, because there are tells as to whether a guy may break down or a gal may break down based on their mechanics. I think what I'm saying, which maybe is what we've had a lot of success at, is we do come back to that mechanical and that linear approach. I think the step that I'm talking about, though, is we first sort of like break the mold. And we just free up the athlete and we really want to take them out of any mechanical thoughts. We really want to push them sort of like right brain, left brain. We want to throw them into the right brain, throw them into their, it's almost like a meditation. We just want to free them up. Let's find out organically and intuitively what happens. And then once this freedom has happened and this, you know, this, this organic position has, ha has occurred, now we can start playing with where we want them to be more in a linear fashion. I did that in two breaths, Tom, sorry. Go for it, Tom. I was going to say that I, I think I can coordinate some words here. What Alan is talking about, uh, like he mentioned earlier what the zone is and literally defined the zone is when thinking is inversely proportionate to the stimulus of the environment. In other words, you can't think and feel at the same time. Right. What you need to do is think about it and then just go experience the feel. Right. And most athletes are see and feel guys, not think guys. So it would, it's, it's only logical that if we can agree that the body is not dumb if you let it be smart, and you take the parameters off of an individual, in other words, you free him up to do more than he's ever done or differently than he's ever done, his body, depending on how he feels and where he is in his you know, season, whether it's you know, building, uh, maintaining or competing, um, it, he will find on that given day the best homeostasis possible. He'll, he'll mix and match, not to mix and match metaphors, but he'll, he'll, he'll put together the accelerators and the decelerators around a fastball, a curveball, and a changeup. And oh, by the way, uh, I have no problem with long tossing curveball sliders, changeups, and split fingers too. There's one more input that the human brain can put together. And when we said earlier, distance magnifies mistakes. If, if Nolan Ryan's hit the hat drill, he wouldn't leave the field till they hit the hat 10 times. And sometimes in Texas, when it's 110 degrees, that's a long afternoon. But he felt if he could hit something at a distance, he was much better when he got to the mound about locating, and he had location problems his whole life until he came to the Rangers and we started structuring his um, long toss, actually measuring what it was doing to his body. So th there's a place for the science and there's a place for the intuition that the body has to achieve homeostasis. And I think what Alan and I are talking about are the same thing, just looking at it from two different directions. Awesome framing, and um, it's funny for me because you're you're talking to a guy who grew up uh, doing the hit the hat drill on Jackie Robinson Field at UCLA with with Ken Medlock. If you guys know him, and 
And then as I got older and, and met Alan, also did a uh, long toss with, with an arc. So I've been a part of both of it and used both uh, both programs to be athletic and, and free. Tom, I know like you're a huge believer in this be athletic concept. And we've all got the, in Mustard, we've all got the book range big believers in, in mustard as, as we've been taught by you for kids to play multiple sports growing up, um, develop different types of athleticism that they can draw on later in life. I wonder where you think uh, throwing on an arc might fit in or not fit in with that. I mean, more specifically, how, how do you feel about long toss incorporating with an arc? Well, we've trained javelin throwers too. And throwing with an arc with a baseball, a six, a six ounce or one pound, throwing a football with an arc um, is, is great. And we actually use that to get the athletes out of their physical box so they're not constrained and trying to stay perfect mechanically at the expense of what their body's capable of doing. But for, for me, the kids that can really give the arc um, that you're looking for, the ones that can throw, you know, 300 feet, 350 feet across the field, whatever it might be. Um, I'm not sure that equates to command when they get to the mound. Um, and they may be trying to adapt and accommodate their arm to something that uh, I don't, I, it's not going to hurt them but it may be overworking or doing something that is a little bit more than need. they need to go to the mound and be effective there. So it's not the criticism of the arc. It's, is, is it really gonna contribute for the time spent and the effort and the energy it takes out of the arm to do that, whether there's uh, rewards for the effort? That, that would be the one question I have. Yeah, can I jump on that? Cause I. I love it, Tom. You said something, you said it twice now. Help me out with it again about something magnifies mistakes. What was the word again? Distance magnifies mistakes. So what I want to do, because I love everything you said, and here's my piece on the distance magnifies mistakes. So I'm going to turn it into the positive where, and I'm not saying you said it was negative. I'm just saying that you're, that was one of your concerns at 300 plus feet. That's where you could exaggerate um, issues. And, and is it worth it at that point? Because now you're starting to possibly create problems. And so for me, it actually, that's a positive. Meaning when we have guys, and as you know, like everything in life, we progressively build out. But at some point when guys do get to 270, 310, 360, you know, some of these really big distances, it actually becomes a huge benefit because athletes are able to throw to throw, make micro adjustments, but also they start realizing that because there is more magnification of, of, of a mistake, it tunes them more into their body in a way in some of these more um, expanded places or, or what I called you know, earlier more of an intuitive state. And I actually find this as a huge positive because all of a sudden players, it's like a competition. You know how much athletes love to compete. If you hit someone in the chest at, let's say, 300 feet, and you can do that three times in a row, or, and further out you get, the, the, the better you're able to hit somebody in the chest consistently. Well, now all of a sudden, this to me is like a different, it's like a black belt going to a fifth degree black belt. Now you're having to organize your body. You're having to have this different level of proprioception feel. And now you're having to sync your mechanics in a way where, where, where there's more potential danger of coming out of your mechanics. And now you're actually able to repeat at 300 feet or 330 or 360. And so to me, and even at 200 or 220 or 240. So that's where I actually find this time at Tom as being like a, a major, major benefit. Now I'm not saying everybody can pull this off right away. It might take training, you know, um, maybe not everybody can do it as well. And maybe as you said, there comes a point where it's like, you know, you're still exaggerating problems and, and now this is becoming a, a, a different kind of problem. But I guess I would just say that based on the, the uh, you know, more of the masses, this feels to me like players do really adapt, whether it's 180 or, or 380, <laughs> they actually do start adapting to these massive distances. And I feel like, again, that's where back to the feel, 
it's such a huge plus for an athlete to have to go into that deep, deep feel of how do I organize my body, as you said, without thinking about anything. And so I think, as you said, Tom, we're, we're coming from two angles. We're saying very, very similar things. And, and I think this is why this conversation is so great because just people hearing the verbiage of like how the distance can be a detriment or how the distance can really be a positive. Right. And so anyway, and I'll, I'll, I'll kick it back to you guys. On I that. don't know whether you're aware or not, but you use big words too. You use proprioception. I still and have from Lance Wheeler, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so propri proprioception is knowing where your body is in space. Yeah. And then the next words to go with it are kinesthetic awareness. And everything that you just talked about is kinesthetic awareness. It's how my body moves in space. Hmm. And when you come, when you combine proprioception and kinesthetic awareness into a throwing program, that's how you build adaptation to accommodate to the workloads. And again, the only thing that I, I might have criticism of in everything you just said, there's diminishing returns after X amount of throws at X amount of distance, where you're not preparing yourself to have skill at throwing at 320 feet. You're preparing yourself to have skill at throwing at 54 feet or 60 feet, six inches, depending on how you measure. And is the extra distance and the extra launch angle worth the repetitions when it could be the same thing could be accomplished a little bit easier at X amount of feet and X amount of intensity. So the, the argument isn't anything other than what is the most efficient way for this athlete to get the job done that he's getting paid for or is trying to do to get to a position where he can pay for his school or make a living at it. Uh, if it's okay, let me, let me ask Tom a follow-up question on that that um, he and I have talked about offline. Um, Tom, you know, as, as I've told you, probably the best I ever threw in my life. Now, again, I didn't have the chance to, to work with you when I was, when I was playing, wish I did. Um, best I ever threw in my life was when I was in pro ball and I was in Allen's pro camp and it would be after these long toss sessions and, um, doing, doing the pull downs. The only time in my life I ever had a nasty changeup was right after doing pull downs. Yeah. And it wasn't until I met you and really learned from you, Tom, that I understood why that was. I always thought maybe otherwise I'm not loose enough. You know, I don't know. There was something magical going on with Alan. He was sprinkling pixie dust on me. I didn't know. When I met you and really learned, you know, some of the key mechanical elements from you and we developed mustard, I realized that after long toss, that was probably the only time in my pitching career that I was actually moving fast because nobody ever taught me to move fast. Uh, it was my stride length was probably further, probably my balance, my spine angle at release point was more because of the point you made, Tom, that to throw, I think this is what he means, uh, that distance magnifies mistakes to throw at a distance. I had to stay online. If I was doing this, I wasn't going to get the ball all the way to my partner very effectively. So I'm just, so, so could you, could you just talk a little bit about um, using kind of athleticism, Tom, and potentially where long toss might fit in? where it might help your mustard report card, it might help your Tom House mechanical report card. That would be great. And because you actually had input from both of us as, as a pitcher, um, I, I think what you've just laid out for me is an easier teach than I would have uh, if we were talking from three, three different viewpoints. When you're going through the system as a pitcher, you hear throw strikes, get the ball over the plate. And we all have a tendency, every one of us, the three of us, you back off on intensity to where you can throw strikes. And what we've done with the velocity improvement program and what we've figured out in the last 10 years, that you can learn how to throw strikes going Mach 3 with your hair on fire, but you'll never throw strikes to the, to the ultimate level of your genetics if you put a ceiling on what you have to do to throw strikes. So what the, the weighted ball program and what you are talking about and what I, I believe Alan is talking about 
the freedom of long toss, because you can't throw 360 feet and have bad mechanics. Your body is going to figure out a way to advance the ball 360 feet and get it as close as you can to the target you're throwing at. And I'm going to do a little sidebar real quick here. We actually, because of our relationship with the Australian Institute of Sport, we actually got boom guys that could throw a boomerang. And you're aware that a boomerang is bigger than you think it is, and it weighs about a pound and a half. And it's basically a striking implement that if you miss the target, it comes back to you. So think about what the Aborigines did with a boomerang. They were able to throw, and I'll just say a kangaroo because I don't know any other animals they throw out over there. But they could throw out a kangaroo like a pitcher would throw a curveball to get it, you know, in other words, throw it out there to get it down there. That's the beauty of what Alan's talking about. If you give the body the freedom to interpret the move that is necessary proprioceptively and with kinesthetic awareness, and they have the physical attributes to handle that intensity, then you've got an athlete that's gonna come out the other end better for the experience. But if any one of those variables are messed up, we now know through research over 50 years that it only takes one, rep one repetition to change a position. It can take thousands of repetitions to, to fix a movement, make it more efficient. So somewhere in between lies our long toss or online program that is a complement to what they're doing before and after for skill work throwing on the mound, for weight room activity, for recovery and for mental emotional dealing with the stress and anxiety of competition. All those things fit together. And the cool thing what I've seen about long toss is that you kind of go into the zone with it. When, when you get right down to it, Nolan would tell me, shut up until I line it up. So I always talk too much. And Ellen, I think you can empathize with that. Um, sometimes they, an athlete doesn't want to hear words. He didn't want to hear me speak until he fit, felt the feeling and lined it up. But what he was doing was getting in the zone for hit the hat. And then the same thing translated when he got to the mound, he got like, I'd say, Nolan, where was that pitch? He said, I don't know where it was, but I missed Pudge's glove by eight inches. So it's perspective and you have to know your athletes and make sure, and I'm gonna give you a, a compliment here, Alan. What you've done over the years is you've been able to reframe your teach to fit the athlete you're dealing with. It's a gift for an instructor or a coach. What, what I see a big problem with in the game today, coaches only have one way to teach. You have to be able to adjust your teaching to the way the, the way the kid you're working with learns. And I think because of your background with meditation and your yoga uh, understanding, you're, you're able to reframe the way you teach to fit the way the kid learns. And I think without blowing too much smoke your way, that's, that's the gift that you've been able to provide even if we're not exactly uh, in line with the physics of it, what I know that you have, and I believe I have, is the ability to work with your athlete for the best way he can learn what you're doing. And one of your toolkits is long toss. So that's, that's the way I choose. There's the collaboration for me. Well, first of all, thank you um, on many levels, because you know how much respect and appreciation I have for you. and. As you said, Tom, at the end of the day, that was the whole goal of this is, is, is we've both done this for a very long time. And um, I know you have a huge science background and you also obviously have a, a great field background. And uh, so I have to lean also on the science community because I don't have a whole lot of science background. But I do think the one thing I always try to do, as you said, is talk in a way or not talk in a way that just <clears throat> empowers the athlete and allows the athlete to start to figure out intuitively what works best for them. And uh, 
and that's why I love the mission you guys are on now. And, um, and these kinds of chats are great because at the end of the day, all you and I care about in Rocky, obviously, is helping kids, helping the community, advancing the game and, and doing it in an open way. Because we're both very open to learning. We're both very open to trying new things. And um, but we both have a lot of experience. And, uh, and like you, I think the thing that I, I appreciate um, as much as anything, when I talk to someone like you um, or Rocky, or Randy Sullivan or Jerry Weinstein or whoever, what makes me feel really good is that I'm a feedback guy, I'm an input guy. So I love to hear feedback. And I think, as you know, we, we just sort of subconsciously troubleshoot as we go based on feedback from people we respect. So I think you and I have got to a point, um, you know, where, well, we just care is the bottom line. We care about advancing the game. We really care about helping people. And um, I think that's the bottom line. So thank you, buddy, for the kind yeah. compliment. But you know how I feel about you, buddy. You, you've, you've been instrumental for countless people and uh, unbelievable amount of respect for you, man. Well, you, you said it earlier, if you combine the years we've been out there working with kids, I don't think there's two people that have been in front of more athletes than we have. Would you agree? Yeah, well, I mean, you're, you got me probably by a good 10 or 15 years, but um, I think for 32 years that, that, that we've been doing it, um, I've, I've just been on the, you know, I've spent a lot of time on the field, but um, I'm sure there's other people that have done a lot, but I, I feel like you and I have, maybe for, for starters in, in the field that we're in, you know, like, although you cover a lot of people. <laughs> well, we're, uh, the, the, the bottom line is we're still here and we're still full on the experts. So we do this and rock off camera. When, we, when you see us doing this, there's a reason for that. Hey, one more question for, for you guys. I know we're running a little over and, and then maybe I can synthesize a bit after that. But one issue we didn't get to, I'm curious for both of your views, uh, crow hopping versus shuffling. Is this GFF, the just get your yeah. body moving. So, so you're fine with either, Tom, whatever's comfortable yeah, for the athlete. A crow hop, basically, you're stepping in, in front when you initiate the movement. A step behind or a shuffle step, you're stepping behind. But the whole idea is, can you get your body moving as fast as you can, as quick as you can? Well, and Tom, you like a run and gun, too, which is a yeah. the next level of GFF, I yeah. take it. That's, and if you look at it, um, believe it or not, even though outfielders think they're crow hopping, they're running gunning. When right. you watch them, they throw and they'll actually spin and fall on their face. That's how, that's how much momentum is going forward. Awesome. And Alan, same question. Yeah, so we're, we're, we have a, a, a different approach where running guns or getting aggressive with the legs at a, in, a, in a time and a place are fine. But since the majority of your throws on flat ground, um, we want obviously your arm is protected. Obviously, so does Tom. We want your arm is protected as much as possible. We actually don't want any movement forward. Um, but we want loading off. Let me let me rephrase that. We want to first of all always crow hop off the back leg. So right handers, right leg, left handers, left leg. The, the, the main reason why is because you get optimal ground forces when you load off your backside. Um, you engage your glute, your hips. <clears throat> also, it's way over my head, but Randy Sullivan and I, we actually had, it's a, he posted something on YouTube, but he and I had a long talk about things that Tom would have a better understanding about, about pelvic load maybe. And um, so without going into the science or anatomy of it, I grew up, as you know, Rocky, we talked about this. I grew up body surfing. And the cool thing about body surfing is that your body's in the wave and you, you, you could feel the wave more so than probably even surfing. And I always remember that feeling of just the wave gathering and gathering and gathering. And then if I caught it right, of course, it would just, the amount of force and power of pushing me was other level. And to me, I look at throwing the same way. Um, loading off the backside allows the, the, the wave to gather, gather, gather. The arm is now along for the ride. So we actually don't want fast movements, even though we want fast movements for other reasons at other times, but we want it to a minimal amount because we actually want the arm supported as often as possible. So for our guys that and gals, if we do a long toss session, 
we don't mind the first few throws at 30 to 50 feet of you know what their legs are doing that much. We we just want a lot of relaxation, if you will. Uh, but as soon as they start making throws, let's say 70, 80 feet, uh, we immediately want them pro hopping only off the back leg and loading off the back leg. Now at 300 feet, I will admit that the load off the back leg is going to get more aggressive and more aggressive. But the idea is you're still loading off the back leg. And we, we don't want guys shuffling because to me, shuffling is akin to the wave already busted and then the arm is, is, is kind of left out to dry, if you will. So the arm has lost a lot of support. The core is gone, the legs are gone. I mean, now look, we can also talk about the quickness speeds things up and therefore speeds the arm up. Problem is on flat ground as, as opposed to on a decline, right? It's much harder to get out over the front side. So we really want, especially on flat ground, to load off the back leg. And the last thing I'll say is something uh, earlier with regard to Tom and specificity, which I can't say that word properly. Um, but also every time you throw a baseball off the mound, unless you're slide stepping, right? You're loading, you're, you're, you're basically replicating what we want them to do on flat ground. So the other issue for us with guys getting used to shuffling or getting used to going fast is that on a mound, they're not going to do that. They're going to actually do the opposite. They're going to load. That doesn't mean you can't speed up or quicken up your mechanics and get things moving fast eventually. But everybody's going to load. Everybody's going to get to a certain balance point, right? And then the wave is going to release the energy out in front. So this is something, ironically, I have been on a run with the last year or two, like on Twitter. I've been posting videos of guys loading that way. And I'll just say the last thing, because I know I've been talking a lot. I would say that we've been teaching this from the beginning because this is how I did it and it always felt intuitive. But I would say this, every player that we, you can't say every because you're gonna get in trouble. But let, let's just say just about every player that we have ever taken from a shuffle or a step behind, anything that involves not loading off the backside, there has been a visceral effect on the athlete, meaning there's an immediate sensation of the body doing the work, not the arm, ball carrying further without as much effort. And, and again, I just feel like um, from doing this so long that that is one of those uh, fixes um, or principles, I would say, that is a massive deal. And I don't think, and I'm glad you brought it up because I just don't think many people talk about shuffling versus crow hopping off the back leg. So can I pop on that real quick, 30 yeah, seconds? Absolutely. Love what you just you. said is exactly what guys like Nolan said. He wants to throw hard easy. So the physics, using your words and applying physics to it, you weight transfer and you energy translate. So your shuffle or a crow hop or whatever it is that gets your whole body moving when it stops moving forward, when that front foot hits, all that weight transfer turns into an energy translation. That energy goes up and the arms are, like you said intuitively, the arms are along for the ride. If you recruit strength out of sequence or you have movement out of sequence, it's not gonna be efficient getting the energy going through your body into the baseball. And your, your words explain exactly what I just said, force equals mass times acceleration. It's just a matter of vocabulary and understanding the words that describe the movement you're after to get foot pounds, uh, get to get weight turned into foot pounds of energy. So we're talking the same thing, Rocky. It's just that he uses words that most athletes would understand way simpler than coming from, you know, a, a scientific background where power is defined as one half mass times velocity squared. So a power arm isn't necessarily a power arm. It's an arm that can deliver all that energy with speed through time and distance. And that's exactly what he was just talking about only a physics explanation versus a normal coach using words that the athlete would understand. I love that. Can, can I just, sorry, Rick, I know to repress, just a quick follow-up. And Tom, thank you, because I, I love how this, this comes back to, to, to the center. It's really cool. So 
because I think we're saying the same thing. Now, visually, I go out and see this all the time. I see players shuffling their feet. Now, they can shuffle in a way where there's a pause and sort of a load, but can you speak to the fact that once you don't load off the back pole, off that back leg and gather and load to release the ball, what I still have an issue with is even when guys shuffle, even if for gals, even if they're, they're sort of creating a, a spot, I still feel like the pelvis, the body is sort of, once. You, in other words, running guns are too extreme as an example, but a lot of the, the, the body is gone. A lot of the ground forces are gone. So when I see people shuffle at all, it still is hard for me to not put them, trying to get them immediately to look into loading off the backside. Well, what you think, and again, your our eyes lie to us. And we grow up, stay back, stop at the top, you know, collect, make sure you achieve a balance point before you start forward. But literally translated, physics or otherwise, you create, once you initiate body movement, there is no staying back. The faster you can get your center of gravity over the furthest distance in the least amount of time, the harder you're gonna throw easy. So a good arm isn't necessarily a good arm. A good arm is, a, is an arm that has been able to get the energy from weight shift turned into basically foot pounds coming up through the system. If you recruit legs out of sequence, torso out of sequence, or arms out of sequence, you're never going to throw as as hard as you could genetically with doing it in the proper sequence in the right time. So if you add a time component to what you call loading your back leg, it looks like they load, but they don't. Their center of gravity is actually moving. It looks like they're staying back, loading the backside, but the weight is on their back leg. But that feeling that you have where you're actually loading your backside is actually your quad disallowing your knee to bend any more than it already is. So the position that your knees are in when you initiate movement, the, the recruiting of the back leg that you that you felt that I felt it, is not it's not a power move. It's a stabilizing move while your total center of gravity is moving forward. The best athletes in the world translate, they weight transfer and they translate energy in the least amount of time. Long story short, if you can go fast into foot strike over distance, you're going to have more energy to throw hard easy. Alan, if it's all right, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in there, but I think um, unbelievable discussion and I, and I thank both of you for taking the time to do it. Lots of other topics we could dive into more on this topic too. Maybe we can, uh, maybe we can all do it again. It's a must do. We need to get there and start working on the brain too. Let's work on the brain. Well, we're going to have a conversation, by the way, Tom, with with Alan and, and Jason Goldsmith tomorrow. Okay, so, awesome. Yeah. That's a good I'll point. just I'll just propose one little three point uh, synthesis, if that's okay. I mean, one of um one of the key learnings I took away from Clayton Kershaw in the master class we filmed with him, which which we'll start showing next week. Clayton's huge on routine, right? And he's got his very specific daily routine dialed into the, you know, the exact minute he leaves the house before a start every time. Uh, but his point to kids was having a routine is more important than having the perfect routine. Okay. I think that was the, that was the quote from him. And so it's really interesting hearing you guys describe your programs where on the big topics, there's a lot of similarities. Um, and so maybe the important thing for some kids is to dive into one of the programs, make it yours, um, but make sure whatever program you're adopting has some of the key principles that both you guys agreed on here. Some of the key principles I heard, um, be athletic, get your reps in, but also do the arm strength that's necessary, you know, a band program or something similar. Uh, and then the last thing, listen to your body, you know, be athletic, get your reps, listen to your body, develop a routine that works for you.